Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Space Connects Us event where we bring science and space experts from around the world to you, the public, either online or in person. I am your host, Colleen Fiaschetti, the Program Director of Asteroid Foundation here in beautiful Luxembourg. Today, I am joined with astronomer, author, and journalist, Dr. Stuart Clark, to discuss what it means to be a science communicator. Welcome, Stuart, and thank you for joining us today. Hi, Colleen. It's a real pleasure to be here. It's um, you know, going to be a great opportunity uh, to talk about science communication and how I, how I got into it and how I do it. Well, we're just so happy to have you. And uh, before we get into the discussion, I would like to just say hello to all of our viewers from Brazil and greater Latin America. This Space Connects Us event was co-organized by Asteroid Day Brazil National Event Coordinator, Thayanara Nascimento. Thayanara is a university student with a passion for educating young people about the importance of space and science. She is the National Event Coordinator for Asteroid Day Brazil, one of the most active countries to host asteroid independent, event, independent events around the world. Each year, Brazil organizes an array of events, including stargazing, meteorite expositions, arts and crafts, and more. We invite you to chat with Dianara during the event on Asteroid Day's Facebook and Twitch accounts. She will be sending your questions to me live during the event, so feel free to say hello to Thayanara now. Finally, I want to thank our sponsors, Broadcasting Center Europe, SES, Luxembourg Space Agency, B612 Foundation, and the Luxembourg Chamber of Commerce, whose generous support makes all of our events possible. All right, let's get into it. It's not easy to communicate ideas that are particularly complicated. But today, more than ever, there is a need for the public to understand the scientific research and discoveries, which can have massive future implications. From healthcare to climate change, geology to astronomy, the underlying challenge will always be how to clearly, concisely, and simply explain the research, ideally without relying on sensational headlines or miscommunication. Walking the line between both the right and left brain, the job requires a unique understanding of both science and psychology. Stuart, you are a widely known science author and journalist, writing for publications such as the BBC, The Times, The Guardian, and The Economist. You've published over 20 books, the latest being Beneath the Night, How the Stars Have Shaped History, the History of Mankind which has just been released in the UK last year and will be published in Brazil by Universo dos Libros this next year. You've also assumed the role of Asteroid Day's editorial director and are leading all of our communications. Can you just tell me, begin by telling me a little bit about how you first became interested in science and astronomy? Yes, um, I wish I could um, because there's no moment in my life that I can remember when I suddenly became interested in the stars, the universe, the night sky and astronomy. I just always seem to have been interested. And so it's, you know, career choice in a way was just a very simple thing for me. There was nothing else I ever thought about doing or becoming my interest in 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 this universe around us and you know more so as i've got older our place in that universe um has just always been there and always been all consuming really and i so i i know you well enough to know that there was actually a moment when you were a <laughs> child that truly was pivotal to you turn to you choosing this career path and uh it would be great to hear about that but also what was your first piece of published work <laughs> yeah so it's all um it's all related to star wars all of it <laughs> and you know i had this overwhelming interest in space and i saw no distinction between the facts of astrophysics and you know stargazing and the, the planets of the solar system and then applying the imagination to these big science fiction um films um and yeah i um 
it was when I was 10 years old and I was sitting in the cinema and it was 1978 and I was watching Star Wars for the first time. And in the UK, we got it um, several months, six months or so um, after the US. So by the time I was sitting in the cinema and watching this film, I already knew it backwards. I'd read all the magazines, I'd read all the comics, I'd read the books, but nothing prepared me for a, a key moment, which was when, uh, when the Millennium Falcon takes off from Tatooine at the beginning of the movie. Mm -hmm. And you go from this bright desert world and suddenly in an instant, you're in space and the cinema just plunged into darkness and there were all the beautiful stars on the screen. And I got the same feeling, exactly the same feeling as I did when I was standing outside stargazing under the night sky. You know, every time I'd, you know, my parents would bring me home from somewhere and we'd be going from the car to the house. I'd always be looking up. You know, I was the child that used to open the curtains when they were in their bedroom at night and just stare at the stars and sort of mm. wonder about them. And so in that moment uh, in the cinema, it really hit me. And of course, there was a big orchestral sort of fanfare and and it was, it was just sensory overload almost and my imagination just neutrally into darkness around that and point. there were all the beautiful that space was magnificent mm -hmm. and beautiful there were lots of stories to tell and that those stories could be factual as well as adventure yarns it's um it's so funny that uh so much of what is happening with science in particular in space today is all just dreamt up. It's all science fiction until it isn't. And what a time to be writing and uh, communicating what's happening uh, scientifically because everything that is happening, you could have seen in the movies, you know, 20 or 30 years ago. Um, and these, this is real life. And so it was dreamt up, you know, by the scientists and it's, it's happening now. Absolutely, our imaginations are always ahead of our knowledge and our skills and our technology. But that is the that is the driving force of what becomes science and technology and engineering is our imaginations. It's the, it's the beating heart of human progress. Uh, that's the, the, the horses that are pulling the cart into the future is the human imagination and what we can dream up. I know it's it's so fantastic, and I think that the reason why so many students do decide that they want to walk the path of either an, a scientist or a science communicator is because they do still have that major sense of curiosity and excitement um, over what is possible. And so I, I know that a lot of our viewers right now, um, specifically the ones who are probably trudging through their PhDs, are wondering, you know, what what was your experience of uh, university and going through that process? Yeah, it's um, it's difficult because you've got no. There's no when you're doing your PhD, you're doing original research. You there's no right answer. There's you you don't have a person who's who's sitting there with an answer book and can say yes, you did that right or no, you did that wrong. Um, so you are working sort of without a safety net, really. And it's, it's scary to start with. I think it becomes, it's exciting when you first start and then you start to feel lost somewhere in the middle of it um, because you can see all the possible directions that you can go in, but you start to second guess the value of what you're doing, whether you're on the right tracks or not. Uh, and ultimately, when you do finally pull it all together, you have a level of confidence that you can't imagine until it happens to you, that you have done something, you have contributed to the body of human knowledge that we call science, or whatever your PhD happens to be in. And for the human race as a whole, that work is now in the bag. And it's there for others to build on, you know, in the future. 
so it's it's super tough um but it is super rewarding and my supervisor gave me one of the best pieces of advice possible when i was in that real dip phase of not knowing whether what i was doing was 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 worth anything and i can remember saying to him one day i said you know i'm just not convinced that the idea we're pursuing is right mm. and he said to me it doesn't need to be right it just needs to be interesting and that's the motivation to keep going that you're working on something that is interesting and if at the at the end of the day you discover a showstopper in your idea you've done a great job you can tick that off the list you can say we've tried that we know it doesn't work and to a large extent we hear about the discoveries and the breakthroughs in science all the time but actually most of science is about discarding the impossible science proceeds by falsification so when you have a result that you can show clearly that's not going to do what you want it to do you have made progress and that's you know a great feeling in and of itself it it's uh it sounds like that scientists found out way before uh it's been preached specifically among tech companies these days that failure is actually something very much to be cel celebrated and that you just keep on trying keep on learning and and through those through those ups and downs and those tough times you will come out on the other end uh wiser and absolutely you know it's a uh, no pain no gain and and all of that but you know there is a real truth to that and albert einstein for example working in the early 20th century to try and do a tiny little correction to Newton's theory of gravity, to make a tiny little change so that he, so that we could understand the movement of Mercury in its orbit. One of the things that Newton's gravity didn't, uh, didn't explain correctly. And Einstein, he tried time and time again for a decade he worked and for a decade he hit dead end after dead end after dead end and each time he pivoted and tried something new because he had that belief that you know if mercury is moving like we observe there has to be a reason there has to be an explanation and at the end of that decade he finally did the sum that gave him the right answer and the framework, the mathematical framework that he had created that got him to that answer and the new concepts that he had um, are what we now call general relativity. And out of that came the prediction of black holes, the understanding that the universe began at a single event in the past called the Big Bang. And so just by trying to correct a, a little error in the movement of Mercury, he gave us the framework that showed us that our universe had a definite beginning and the mathematical tools to investigate that beginning. So it doesn't matter how many times you fail, you only need to be successful once. I just, I love that. Everybody take that home with you. I know I will and I, I try to every day because that is wise words from Stuart Clark. Um, speaking a bit more about the communication side of things, uh, I don't know how much failure is celebrated on the communication side of things. It can be, uh, you know, kind of scary these days, uh, coming up with certain sensational headlines or trying to get the audience's attention and keeping it while still maintaining the points of the research and, and having them leave with the important pieces. How do you manage that and what's your advice there? So, you know, very quickly, if you publish something and you've got something wrong, <laughs> I mean, you really do know I bet. very, very quickly. Um, and, and it happens to all of us. I mean, it, it, you know, I can be pretty confident 
in astronomy and across the broad sweep of that subject, even though, you know, my specialism, my PhD was in infrared astronomy. Uh, but I can be pretty confident. But that doesn't mean I'm immune to making mistakes and just pressure, deadline pressure. Um, you feeling a little subpar one day, something like any anything like that can mean that occasionally, you know, something creeps in um, that that doesn't quite work. Sometimes you've just made a factual error. Sometimes you've you've not phrased yourself in a way, um, or you've phrased yourself in a way that leaves it open to interpretation. And in those situations, you know, you get feedback very, very quickly, and you you just correct the error on the website, say if it's published on a website. Uh, and then at the bottom of the piece, you note the correction. So you acknowledge that it's a revised version uh, and say thank you to the person or the people that's pointed it out and just and everyone's happy, you know, in that uh, in that sense. Sometimes if you've you know not fully um, got the meaning of something correct and someone has read your work and has come away with a, a wrong interpretation of it and has written in because of that, then explaining to them uh, that you didn't explain it correctly in the first place and that you've given them the wrong idea and that, you know, based on their feedback again, you've made a little correction and this hopefully is the right idea now um, for them again. It's just, it's all part of the process and just, something we have to embrace especially now that we're in a more uh in a world where communication is more of a two-way thing mm -hmm. so in the past you'd publish in a magazine or a newspaper you know and you'd probably wait for a week or so to get a reader's letter or something like that now it, it, i mean it's literally instantaneous Right. I know it, it does sound like it's actually a, a bit better for that reason. I mean, like you said, if you're posting an article on a website and then, you know, you get something wrong, you can immediately go back in and update it. And for the next reader, they're going to have the updated information. So it does sound uh, like it's a bit easier for that reason. And um, I want to get back to, you know, more more of you certainly talking about uh, your writing uh, as a journalist, but I want to talk about your other methods of communications, primarily the novels you've written. Um, in uh, the, it was the 2010, um, in the 2000s, you, you released the, uh, the Sky's Dark Labyrinth trilogy. And in it, you did an excellent job of weaving fact and fiction through the point of view of a scientist. Why did you end up choosing this avenue and, and writing these books? Yeah, it's a really interesting story about the way that that all came about. So publishing, like anything else, moves through fashions. And there was a big fashion um, in the sort of early mid 2000s for narrative nonfiction. And this played to my strengths quite a lot uh, because it was clearly a nonfiction book, but um, everything in it is defensible from uh, references and resources. But the way of presenting that material was rather like a storytelling medium. Uh, and it became interesting to a number of writers and a number of publishers to wonder if you could extend that and actually write fiction based around science and because it's fiction and you need really great characters based around scientists themselves and history is often communicated in this way so the works of uh um people like Robert Harris, for example, or Philippa Gregory, they often choose historical events and historical um, people and then dramatize them uh, with what, you know, based on what we know about those events. And so I became very interested in whether this was something that was possible to do with scientists, to explore the motivation of the scientists and uh, why we do it, what science is, the context, the historical context in which it was, it was done, all of which can be lost 
um, in purely non-fiction um, treatments. Uh, and so the, the, the story that I told, that I, I decided to tell, was the story of our understanding of gravity and movement in the universe. So the first book, The Sky's Dark Labyrinth, was about Galileo and Kepler in Germany. Uh, the Sensorium of God was the second novel, and that was the story of Isaac Newton and Edmund Halley and Robert Hooke here in um, the UK. And then uh, The Day Without Yesterday was the story of Einstein and Georges Lemaitre, uh, the Belgian priest and astrophysicist who, uh, who predicted the Big Bang out of uh, general relativity. And to be able to dig into the biographies of those people and present them and their lives experiences their thoughts as best you can from their letters to each other and um, brought science to a different audience than i was talking to before and so i was now talking to people who read fiction rather than specifically searched out popular science and it was a great education for me as well because it allowed me to to bring scientific concepts and a sense of of making the reader comfortable with science what it was what it wasn't why people practice it and why it met resistance uh, it just brought that to a whole um uh, a whole different level of, of discussion with people that, you know, the audiences that I then engaged with and taught me a lot about um, people engaging with science at different levels, the levels that they're comfortable with engaging at. And sometimes it's very factual. Sometimes it's conceptual or philosophical. And other times it's just very human. They just want to know what drives these people because that's how they make sense of their world around them is through human interactions. And so in terms of the, the take home for me for that and science communication is that there's a vast array of ways to do it. There's no one way just to do science communication. Um, it's, it, it's, it's a broad brush approach that we should take and be looking to just talk about science wherever we can and wherever it feels natural to. It, you're absolutely right in that. Um, I think one of the things that so much of the public should remember is that scientists Scientists are, are just like any other human, but they're questioning things and they're they're getting to a level to which we just don't understand. But they still they still have the same fundamental aspects that you'll have a much, you know, a lot of things in common with them. And I think sometimes people don't see that and they don't understand that. And it becomes the scientist, the academic, somebody who understands something that, you know, perhaps I do not. But that isn't really the case that I, uh, the case at all, that there is going to be a way to really explain uh, in layman's terms an idea, which is brings me back to, you know, what you do uh, on the day to day in your job as a journalist. Um, and how, how do you simplify that? How do you get in the minds of, you know, the readers and, and what are you looking to do when you're writing those articles? What I'm really looking to do is make a connection between um, the science that's going on and the reader. And depending on what publication I'm writing for, you can assume certain things. So for example, if I'm writing for New Scientist, then I can assume an interest in science, but I don't assume necessarily an interest in astronomy. And so, you know, I'm fighting for um, their, the reader's attention in, in every sentence uh, and making sure that uh, I'm not assuming any in, innate knowledge or interest in astronomy. And that means I also have to make um, judgment calls almost on a sentence by sentence basis about what I need to explain and what I don't need to explain. Because science communication is different from science education. 
and in an educational environment, you probably want to, to build everything from the bottom up, principle upon principle, and to get to you know, an understanding of the subject. In a communications framework, you don't need to do that. In fact, all you really need to do is entertain people enough to hold their interest to the end of the article. So each moment is a fight for their, for their attention and their interest. And I don't need to go into excruciating details or precision necessarily, so long as what I'm saying is accurate. There's, a, there's like a general level of accuracy and then there's precision. And it's, it's knowing how to juggle that. And that's in, and we learn that by, by doing, and that's what our editors are there for to make sure we, we walk that tightrope as well. Yeah, so I bet this year uh, or this past year with the pandemic, it was uh, particularly difficult to get in any articles and get the reader's attention that was not about the coronavirus. And this actually was a question that was sent in from Irene. How has the pandemic changed outreach activity? Is it more difficult to speak to the public? I don't think it's more difficult to speak to the public. Uh, excuse me a moment. <clears throat> that is a super good question because the context of science communication, the, the arena in which we all work as science communicators constantly changes. And you're right that the, uh, the discussion of the pandemic, which is clearly the most important scientific thing that's happening at the moment, has just soaked up so much bandwidth that it has been very difficult to talk about um, anything else. And more than ever, uh, science communication now, um, especially in the fields of astronomy uh, and space, is about escapism. And it's about giving readers a sense of awe and a sense of wonder. And it's like having a little, a bright light that you know, in in contemplating the universe you know and there are people doing all of this and they're making this progress that is just that takes us away from the day-to-day -day grind of you know, the, the the pandemic <clears throat> and uh even though it's super important to keep talking about the science because of course the vaccination program is what is going to solve this pandemic nothing else is going to solve it um so it's science and medicine that's going to to do that, um, but the rest of us, you know, those are the talk, us talking about science, or space rather. You know, we can we can be the light entertainment um, uh, for this for this time period. Yeah, no, that completely makes sense, and I think that with the with the rise of the the pandemic and the pandemic coming, there was a a moment where everybody was flooding to their social media to news websites, to uh, documentaries that they're finding on uh, Netflix and, and video streaming. And it seemed that in that moment though, there was a massive opportunity for the science communicator to have a piece of that, that pie, that digital pie. And so can you tell me a little bit about how, you know, you've dabbled, that you have a history of dabbling in some digital tools to get your message out there. What do you see as sort of an opportunity for science communicators to, to utilize these new platforms of communication? Oh, yes, absolutely. So any way that humans communicate provides an opportunity for science communication. So all the all the new media tools, you know, those 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 uh, the you know, the the next generation of science communicators and you know those of us that have been doing it for a while we need to embrace all of those as well because this is this is the way that people talk to each other and that changes constantly but the message of science doesn't change and you're absolutely right in this uh in this time of the pandemic it gives us um a, a 
a, an audience that are perhaps willing to engage with how science takes place. You know, why does it take so long, it seems, on a human timescale to come up with a vaccine? What are the steps in that process? And once you, uh, once you unpick that and show what is happening and how science proceeds, you can actually see that the effort to get to a vaccine has been incredibly quick in terms of the of how science usually works this really um super cautious way um that we work it's been a superhuman effort um to get to the to the vaccine so yeah that gives a great opportunity to talk about the process of science and also just utilizing all of the tools make you know TikTok videos or what or, or what have you youtube videos just find ways um, to make it work and each science communicator will find a comfort zone somewhere where they can excel maybe that's in a subject area maybe that's with a particular piece of communications technology again there's no right or wrong way to do it all that you know is important is that you find a way to do it that makes it in a genuine authentic way to yourself but I mean, that sounds completely right. And I think that everybody would always write or do any type of craft from the heart. So, so long as you're passionate, I think the, the quality of your work will always be that much better. Uh, we have another question that's actually come in. Um, it's from Daniel. He's saying, how can we fight against fake news and science? Yeah, um, this, is the, this is the battleground at the moment and um i think the way that you can do it is in your science communications you're not simply recounting facts and you're not simply uh sort of saying if you don't believe it fine go away i don't want to hear about you know from you about it it's it, it's about saying this is how science works and explaining the process of science. It's also about explaining the way that a scientist will will tension um, skepticism with curiosity, and that's the balance that each researcher uh, has to find for themselves, um, and. This, this is the way that they discriminate uh, in their work between what they, what, what's right and what is wrong. And so by learning how to construct an argument ag against uh, something, in learning how to investigate whether it's true or not, and maybe that's a physical investigation with an experiment, maybe it's more of a thought process, um, that is how we counter fake news um, and a lot of fake news is very sophisticated there's no way that we can say that it isn't because it's designed to produce an emotional response in um, the reader uh, and it's designed to do that in a way um, often in a negative way to, to spark a, a outrage or anger or something like that so I think that as science communicators, we can um, fight back against that by using science to engender positive emotions in people. We can be impressed by the dedication of a scientist. We can be mind blown by a discovery. We can feel awe at the beauty of nature. And knowing the science behind that only deepens the pleasure. You know, looking at, say, a, a plant and its beautiful green leaves and knowing that the green of the plant's leaves are because the plant only really absorbs the blue and the red part of the spectrum because of the molecules in the chlorophyll and the green light and the yellow light is, is reflected away. And that's why plants appear green. You know, that's amazing that we have got to a stage you know in history where we understand that where we can see things that we can't normally see with our eyes with our unaided eyes um 
So yeah, we fight against fake news, um, not by railing against it and not by raging about it, but just by presenting a much more positive, um, a much better alternative and we play the long game. This will turn around um, and it's the, the role of science communicator in that is critical actually. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think the world uh, right now is wondering who can they trust, where can they read and, and what can they believe? And within that, there has been sort of a lashing out really against the science community and a mistrust in that as well. I, where do you think that kind of came about and what do you think will happen coming up? What can these young science communicators that are gonna be coming out of school uh, think of and and bring on you know their skills to know how to combat this yeah i think there are a number of uh places that it's come from uh and one of the one of the one of the reasons i think for a bit of a a backlash against science and a and and a, a rejection of its uh of its principles and its core values is because um, there has been a movement to communicate science more to people. And as part of that movement, people have sought to, to, to try and grab headlines. And so perhaps they have um, overstated the value of discoveries. Perhaps they have been a little more definite in um, a link in, in medicine, for example, between, say, a drug and a side effect or something that we eat and an illness than perhaps um, is really there in the data. And the journalists who have been communicating that um, have not communicated the conditional nature of the conclusions that they're reporting or indeed the scientists maybe have not been as uh, as, as as honest about the, that as they could have been so we find ourselves now in a in a situation where all of us as science communicators should not simply be blind science cheerleaders we should have a knowledge and an understanding of how science works so that we can be uh, we, we can be informed about the scientific process and we can equip our readers and our viewers with the tools that they need to understand where what we're talking about is in the scientific process. Is it just an idea that has been formed and now needs thorough investigation? Is it something we're feeling pretty confident about, but we're still not quite sure? Or is it a, is it the final slam dunk? You know, we we this is in the bag. We totally know this. And so it makes me feel that the next generation of science communicators, more than any other, must be ethical science communicators for want of a better word and simply what i mean by that is to not overstate things to not hype things um, to be super honest about what you're writing about or communicating um, about and use that to help the public understand the process of science not just the end result, which is the traditional thing that has been communicated. So in the news story, try and get a little flavor of the process that's, that's, that's gone on there. You know, science is hardly ever a singular eureka moment. There's usually decades or centuries of thought and experiment that's led to the eureka moment. So tell a little bit of that story and impart a little bit of scientific skepticism to things that don't meet the absolute certainty threshold. 
It's 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 really great advice, Stuart. And um, you know, you you and I both working for Asteroid Foundation are consistently thinking about how can we tell the story of what is going on with asteroid research, asteroid missions, discovery, and uh, the science of asteroids. And so here you have a topic that can be quite sensational that um, you know is getting more press these days than I think it ever has been, uh, which is good in that people are, are becoming aware, but what would you say is sort of your strategy in thinking about talking about a topic which uh, you, know, you could easily fall back on the it's the end of the world. <laughs> How do you approach this? Yeah. So the way I approach it is that I think that, you know, there's films like Armageddon and like the Deep Impact and all the sensationalist headlines that we have had in the past that has at least moved us into the mainstream. The concept of planetary defense now has real currency in the general public. It is a, it is a, the, the, the potential for an asteroid impact is something that pretty much everyone recognizes. Uh, that means we have the real possibility of advancing the story. You know, in journalism, we talk about the news cycle. And a news cycle is when the story breaks, the first thing that happens is the reporting of the facts about that news. The next thing that happens is very often, you know, a day or so later, you know, is a refutation of the news, a strike back or a different point of view or something like that. Often then comes the analysis as we try to make sense of what's going on. And so news has this cycle and it flows, it ebbs and it flows. And sometimes it feels very positive and sometimes the messages are, are, are more negative. And what I see is that this news cycle is, is not just a day to day thing but especially in science communications, it can move on a longer cycle as well. And so we can take advantage of knowing where we are in the news cycle. And whilst we would never have written those sensational headlines, we have to acknowledge the fact that the journalists that have, have done that because they know what will capture their readership's attention. And however a reader has been sensitized to planetary defense and asteroids, that's an opportunity for us to now advance the story in a trustworthy, sensible, expert-led way. Um, so that's the, that's the challenge and the opportunity. And we're never going to stop those sensational headlines. Um, we have to just hope that the person that sees something like that gets online, starts Googling, that we have the information there to tell them, you know, the truth about the subject in a, in a, in a calm and rational way and explain the science. Well, I, I suppose we'll have to save a lot of those discussions that we continue to have here at Asteroid Day for Asteroid Day on June 30th. But we have a couple more questions that have come in for you, Stuart. Um, Maria Rita would like to know, do you have any message that for anyone who's trying to become a researcher? Uh, definitely. And, you know, it's the, to become a scientific researcher today, is just one of the most noble things that you can possibly do. You, you know, if you, if you become a scientist, you are contributing to a human endeavor that stretches back in different forms to the dawn of humankind. And the key to becoming a, a researcher today is to find the subject that totally lights you up. What, what is the subject that stops you turning the light out at night because you've got to just keep reading. You, you're so desperate that you want to know, or it's, it's exciting you so much to know more about that subject. And, and that's the route uh, to go in. 
Now, having said that, some people are going to find that the thing that excites them the most, um, they may have a skill required to practice that, that they find very difficult. Let's take space again, for example, and that in order to, um, you know, in order to become a, a research astronomer, you're going to need to be pretty good at maths because that's pretty much what it is these days. Uh, if you just can't get that, if that is just not you as a, a mathematician, find a related field that you can apply to your, your interest in space, a related job or something like that. So perhaps that is science communicator or uh, there's all sorts of careers now that interface with the sciences. And so you can indulge your passion in science um, in all these related fields. And the more people we have that are passionate about science in non-scientific jobs and that understand science, um, the better that is for science communication in general. It seems like there's actually a lot of room these days for even more science communicators. And I think you're absolutely right in that it doesn't always have to be somebody who is the expert uh, on the mathematics, is the expert even really on the topic, but somebody who is truly extremely enthusiastic about the subject. Um, I guess one question that I, I really have personally is that when talking to the public about you know, things that are happening in space and in astronomy, how how do you make you know your your points interesting and and you, the subject matter interesting to someone who's going through the day to day grind? How how does it how do you make it attractive? Because I know you have done an excellent job, but please tell our viewers what your your strategy is. Yes, yeah, for me, it's it, it's just to have that that sort of almost childlike excitement about it. And I don't mean forcing that. I mean, it's, it, it's keeping an eye open for what's being done, looking at the research papers that are being put up online. There's obviously quite a lot of press releases nowadays that get sent out from universities. And every, you know, and every now and again, something just pings inside you and you go, that is interesting. Uh, or, the other way to look at it is 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 literally the you know the the elevator pitch. Can I explain this work in one sentence? And if you can, it it's probably a goer, you know. And and sometimes that elevator pitch concept gets um, you know, has cold water poured on it, and people reject it. But just think about how you talk. To people in your everyday life you communicate ideas quickly with people you know did you see the television program last night know what was it about you have a sentence to tell them what it was about and and so and what does your what's your job what do you do at asteroid day you have a sentence or so to explain that to them otherwise you lose their interest so we're all doing this all of the time and so if I feel that initial excitement at the result, you know, and there are certain things that I know people love, and that's a bit of a learn by doing, but you can learn by just looking at what articles get published. So black holes, um, planets around other stars, anything to do with Mars, especially life on Mars, um, those kinds of things everyone is interested in i mean massive amount anything that you can see in the night sky even if it's just like uh, a full moon or a meteor shower or something like that those kinds of stories how to see tonight's super moon or something like that they can easily be read by over you know by hundreds of thousands of people in a few hours and over a million people in a day 
So it's just connecting really with uh, what, what, what makes that thing inside you go, oh, that's interesting. I think that everybody on the chat and who's watching right now might uh, really want me to ask this, this question from Jailson, following off of what you just said. Um, do you think it's possible that we're going to send a person to the moon or into Mars, excuse me, Mars in the next few decades? Yes, I do. I do. And, and, and well, and Brazil has um, a place to play in that. It's signed an agreement with NASA uh, to become a signatory of the Artemis Accords, which is sort of the, um, the, the sort of quasi legal framework um, to participate in moon missions and to do it for the common good and, and, and all of that. And in part of that, uh, um, in part of that memorandum of understanding, there's the hope that Brazil will build a rover to go to the moon as well. You know, Brazil participates in the International Space Station. It has sent an astronaut. It has a space agency. You know, it's a real, it's an up and coming space power. And so, yes, we're going to send people to Mars. They're going to go to the moon first um, without question and then they will go on to Mars. And why I feel confident in saying that this will happen, how I sort of know that this will happen, is because it is an international coalition of countries that are coming together to do this. So this is not, NASA may be in the lead um, with this and maybe leading this program, but it's not solely NASA, which historically has always been pushed and pulled, depending on the administration and who's in, in power. Um, but now that there is a broad coalition of international partners that can keep this program going, rather like um, it did for the International Space Station, which was having all the same problems until President Clinton put together uh, the International Space Station Coalition. And then you have commitments to other people. You also spread the cost, but you get all the benefits. And so that's why I am absolutely certain that yes, we will be going to the moon and then on to, to Mars with people. That sounds exciting. I hope that I am able to get my ticket for that trip. Although I'm not quite sure they'll be sending tourists to Mars by the time, <laughs> by the time we get there. Um, well, we're, we're nearing the end of the hour, and I just want to thank you for everything that you had said. Do you have any other impart, imparting words to, to all of the young future science communicators out there? The only thing that I would say, and it's the most important thing to say, is, is never give up hope. You, political regimes come and go. Governments come and go. Uh, fashions, culture, uh, come and go. And science always remains. It always does. Ever since, you know, the scientific revolution of 400 years ago, it's been through up times, it's been through down times. The wider um, quest to understand the universe has been ongoing for millennia. It's just what we recognize as modern science began about 400 years ago. Uh, so never give up hope. And just remember that, you know, I mean, I'm bound to say this because I've done this for my whole life, but there's something deeply satisfying about communicating science and being part of this huge ongoing human endeavor that has stretched back millennia and will stretch on into the future because once you understand something scientifically that never changes that knowledge is with you then forever and so science is always additive and the things that you know will always increase you're never going to forget it so the more we can get that message across that this is a bedrock now science of our culture and our society, um, the better the world will become. And the final thing, really, really, I promise it's the final thing, is <laughs> just to say that, of course, science is global. You know, my scientific truths 
are your scientific truths, are everybody's truths. It's something that we can all agree on. And that's what you know, brought me into the role at Asteroid Day, for example, is because it is a global endeavor. It brings us together. And ultimately, you know, that's the best thing that we can do is bring everybody together. Stuart Clark, thank you so much. And I think you did an exceptional job of bringing everybody together to watch this uh, Space Connects Us event. So thank you for being here. It's really my pleasure. Thank you. And with that, I would like to thank Asteroid Day Brazil's national coordinator, Thayanara Santos, I'm sorry, Nasiama Ento, and uh, for helping me make this event possible. Thank you again to the generous support of Broadcasting Center Europe, SES, Luxembourg Space Agency, B612 Foundation, and the Luxembourg Chamber of Commerce. Thanks everybody for joining us and we'll see you next time at Space Connects Us.